Okay. All right. Um, so this is a lecture about biogeochemical proxies, which we've already talked about a whole lot, right? We've seen, we've been introduced to a number of biogeochemical proxies throughout the whole class. So we started learning about IOPs, and then um, Emmanuel talked about several on Friday. We were thinking about validation, calibration of the measurements. Um, we started talking about them this morning again in Jeremy. Patrick's lectures when we think about remote sensing proxies. So we're going to dive back into them one more time. Um, and the goals are going to be to think about the process of developing and using proxies. And not it's not going to be a tour of the proxies because I actually feel like we've heard them all pretty well at this point, um, with maybe a couple of exceptions. Um, and I can ask the instructors, you know, gallery in the back. But if I've missed, if you think there's anything we've missed in the course so far that we should talk about briefly now, um, I'm in the end. But, um, but more, it's, we're going to talk more about the pitfalls, the uncertainty of the process, um, because that's that's where our brains need to be now. So I want to start off with just ask you guys to do a quick review of the terminology that we encountered yesterday, yesterday Friday, um, from the manual lecture, um, and um, and then also proxy, right? So proxy, calibration, and validation. I've got three figures that are up here. They're all taken from papers that um, I don't think we've seen in this context before. And one of them, I think, is a good example of a proxy, one of validation, and one of calibration. So the top one is uh, non water absorption spectra from the test docket that I'll take through that we talked about in the lecture three. One of them is if you compare some of the volume scattering function from me calculation for latex spheres of a certain diameter, and then the other is the measure of function of those spheres. And then the, the one in the um, short dash gold box here is a comparison of mean accumulation coefficients to particular organic carbon concentrations of the bottom of the level. So what I'd like you to do is turn to two or three of your neighbors and decide which is the best example of which. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feel good. All right. We have one group that feels good. Okay, so uh, what do you guys? Uh, so in, 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 
So the orange box top one um, is the validation for using multiple instruments to measure the same inherent optical pressure. Right? Okay. Is that kind of where folks were falling out on that one? So validation, you remember Manuel talking about that Friday when we are saying, okay, we've got our thing, we think we we know what it's measuring, and now we're gonna we're gonna check it against other things that should be measuring the same thing or agreeing within some expectation, right? Validating our so so this top one is is a great example of a validation exercise. Okay. So calibration and proxy. Which one is our calibration? The lower left one. So the, the long dash blue line box. Okay, so why is that one the calibration? And the theoretical calculation. So that's so we've got uh something that should behave in a known way. And this is this is how we will calibrate a lot of our things that are responding from the same test. Okay. And then this leaves um the yellow dash short line box as the example of a proxy, right? And in this case we're comparing beam attenuation coefficient to the particular organic curve. They're not the same thing. Right at all. We have an expectation that they might still vary, right? And we can use one to predict the other, but we're using one of them to substitute for the other. Okay. Does this kind of feel like the kind of question? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in terms of like if you're calibrating a model, then you could call it a calibration, but I think that it's I guess I'm thinking about the context of this class when we say calibrating an IOD calibrating it against some known IOD points, right? Or if we're calibrating a radiometer, we're calibrating a cloud wave. Right? Okay. Um, no response to the Okay. Um, so, so in this context, we're going to use a proxy um, to mean the use of an empirical relationship between two measurements so that we can estimate one from the other. So, um, so where we're going to go is talk a little bit about why. I think we know why generally, but we can kind of explore that a little bit more. And then I'm just going to go through some cases to highlight different issues with the use of proxies. Um, and then uh, we will come back to your posters a couple of times that you guys made last week um, and think about, because you started thinking about proxies back then, right? And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Okay, so why create and use proxies? I put up here three figures from a modeling study, um, 1998, from a while ago now. Um, this is kind of a classic one that uh, was investigating how turbulence causes the scaling of, um, of different kind of layers of um, hot buttons in ocean vary. So the top panel is a model of some theoretical carrying capacity in the ecosystem function of nutrients of light. The middle panel of phytoplankton that are driven by that carrying carrying capacity, and then zooplankton that are working with phytoplankton. And you can see that there's just this uh, increase in the complexity, right? The spatial complexity, the spatial scale. Um, get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go up. And so I'm just putting this up here to illustrate inherently there is a lot of variability in oceanic processes, and we want to be able to measure those processes on the right scale. Right? If you're interested in things that are happening and changing on a river tidal cycle, we need measurements that you can realistically get samples over that cycle to solve that process. Um, are there other Reasons that we'd want to create or use proxies besides just matching our observations to our processes and things like that. Yeah, we're trying to understand complex 
You can kind of understand things that are complex to measure with simpler measures. Okay, so to reduce complexity. Be some pragmatic learning. Okay. Anyone ever gone to see a seven the So, um, if I paraphrase you, it's uh, it's a lot more labor intensive to actually put quite a bit of themselves than it is to measure for yeah. right? Um, and I, I'm going to actually extend from what you said, and I'm just going to write plot because all those bottle samples getting a ship out of the sea, sending people on ships. Buy the equipment to get the direct samples, right? So there's there is a real pragmatic uh, reason that we do this. Um, and I would also just say, and kind of related to that, like access uh, to the environment, and the job of the right? Now we can go where we need to go. So that's the reason we promote sensing, topics, et cetera. Thoughts? The peanut gallery comes back. <laughs> No, okay. All right. Yeah, it's a very good. Yeah, it's a it's a it was formative for me in the first time. Um so what assumptions do we make when we create a bond? There's some information that we So we are assuming there's only one enemy or control over the um, only Great. Uh, so, uh, kind of going back to this initial assumption that we're making that there is a relationship between the, the who we're targeting and the proxy, we expect the proxy relationship to stem at some level from a physical basis. Um, and I've just listed up here, these are, you guys drew like random pieces of paper from Colin or something as like the proxies that you're going to come up with and measures to measure. But right, how that process works. So that's what each of uh, Jeremy's just here, right? That they just drew the posters on the wall. Um, and they went through a brainstorming exercise that Colin guided them through. And so she had them choose each randomly a thing, uh, VOC, POC, phytoplankton biomass, phytoplankton composition, and bulk particle composition. And then they came up with a list of proxies that might um, enable them to get it back and then what the do they want to get the question. But um you know, here, the, just briefly, you know, the physical relationship underlying those proxies, so VOC, right, the, the physical relationship is that there is some blue light absorption that is associated with some component of VOC that co-varies with VOC, right? That's where that comes from. Um, you listed the attenuation as a good proxy for VOC, right? So we're assuming that they're both co varying to first order with mass of particles, right? So the attenuation and POC. Um, phytoplankton biomass from the ISTV physical relationship is that the, the biomass is going to relate to the projected area of the cells, which is what that instrument is actually detecting. 
Um, both particle composition, that uh, I think you guys were estimating or subtracting for that, was going to be components of particulate absorption, right? And so that's sort of assuming, okay, there's a Gears law, and it's added in a relationship between the things in the particle and the absorption by the particles. Um, and also assuming that whatever the particles are made of have absorption, specific absorption coefficients that are known. And then your phytoplankton composition um, based on pigment contribution. So it's similar, right? That there is a known spectral response of those different pigments and the gears law apart. So there's sort of a physical relationship with some assumptions and they're lying each of those. Okay, Manuel, I think, said this two weeks ago, a while ago. It's the first order IOP scale with concentration, right? So IOP response you get is going to be related to how much stuff there is. If we want to know more than that, we want to know the composition or size um, or whatever else we're interested in, we're going to need more than just an IOP of something, right? We need um, multiple independently varying wavelengths. I will get to that in a minute. Um, or different angles of scattering, or filtered versus unfiltered measurements, polarization, et cetera, right? So we have to have some additional information to get more complicated than just how much stuff is like Yeah, the thing problem is how you it's uh independent. So you when you do computation, one of the things you do when there's a lot of particles and you see particles. And the dynamic range is the part of the in the actual computation. So now we have very dynamic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you do nice scattering and you go up by 20%, you find know, very high. Some of the concentration change by order of magnification may be used with this activity. But now we use the spectrum of that scattering. Mm -hmm. And each one of them can eventually be used 20%. Then you also can do it. And yeah. suddenly it's much harder to get information on it. We're going to talk about the Kale 2020 paper next. Exactly. The moment you go deeper in computation, you have to make more careful measures. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is really a uh, very adept comment from Wilson. But um, there was a paper a few years ago that um, PD Kill and Ali Pace will be next week, here next week, and Manuel wrote. Um, looking at how many different resources, the, class. the class, yeah, how many independent constituents can you extract from a particular absorption spectrum? And this is just measured in species, by the way. So we kind of go back into the water after talking about remote protein this morning. But this is all related to Jeremy's comments about what the uncertainty is still the data that you're using for your algorithms. So anyway, um, so. The, the sort of driver of this study, um, at least my reading of it, was that if you look at absorption spectra, total absorption spectra in the ocean, they have pretty similar shapes, really, right? And so, as Emmanuel just said, we're looking for these small differences in shape in these noisy measurements. And the, the way that these spectra differ from one, one another is very, it's not very independent from one spectra to the next, right? They all have the same shape. Um, so what they did in this paper was they took a technique called principal component analysis, which some of you, many of you probably know what that is, but just in case you don't, I'm going to briefly introduce it. The idea is that you've got some data that are varying in multiple dimensions, and you want to reduce the dimensionality of that by orienting your data set along orthogonal axes, where um, the first principal axis is capturing the majority of the variability in the data, and the second axis, the next most uh, variability in the data and so forth. Um, this example that I've taken here from a nice blog post I found uh, shows you this in three dimensions. Um, I can't visualize more than that. I'm just looking at it. I saw it through. Um, so that's, that's kind of a nice, uh, but here we've got, you know, data set in three dimensions, axis zero, one, two, and the red, green, and blue axes are basically showing, okay, what are the dimensions where those data are actually varying. Um, so if we project this now on two dimensions, right, the third, the green line is the dimension that has the least variability. It's kind of the data on this flat plane that's tilted up. Um, and so that's been, that's not being shown here. Um, 
the red axis is our second PC2 here, and the blue one is PC1, right? And so that contains the greatest amount of variability. So you can do this with complicated data sets. And you can use it to try and find these sort of more objectively find the ways that different um, multi-dimensional data like absorption spectra are co-varying together or not. Um, so in this paper, what they were doing is using PCA to figure out what basic vectors, like Jeremy was talking about, right? The spectral shapes, what are the basic vectors that sequentially describe the most amount of variance in these spectra? So this is the output, the first three modes, the first uh, three most important dimensions um, from this PCA on in situ particulate absorption factors in the star oceans group, which at that time started to achieve global coverage right, with a lot of uh, dynamic range, basically the absorption spectra in the open ocean. So the first mode, um, I don't know if you guys can see that in the in the legend, but it's 94% of the variance of all these basic spectra is explained by variability that has not affected, which is plural, right? So this is basically just saying, okay, almost everything that we can pull out of the in situ basic spectra, just uh, co with the amount of stuff, the amount of chloride. So the next thing they did was they used an absorption line type proxy, looking at that piece in the red, to assign the amount of chloride, remove that, and then do PCA on the residual, the remainder. So that's what they've done in this middle plot here. So the blue line, again, is the first mode, I think the most amount of variability. What is well, I wrote it on this, I'm not going to ask you, but this mostly looks like non algal particular, right? So um, the, the red and the, the yellow lines contain a small amount of the variability, and you can fit pigment spectra to that. You can fit other, sort of more or less of other things to create those, those modes of variability. But even when we've taken out chlorophyll, mode two is only 5%, right? So the take home from this paper was that at most, we're probably going to get four to five degrees of freedom for independently co varying uh, components in hyperspectral absorption spectra observed in situ. And overall, it's just chlorophyll and non particle sort of estimates of those like absorption that are explaining most of the variability. If you need more, and this is exactly what Emmanuel said right before I got to this slide, you need really low uncertainty because you're looking for the small differences in those individuals. Or you need other sources of information. Maybe you need to know okay, what are the phytochemical taxa that we expect to see, or what is the ratio of non algal particles versus the particle that we always find in this environment, or how do they put various season or salinity? Like, what are some other pieces of that you can go? Before I move on, let's move on. Five uh, times the same for the same the the Okay. All right. So um, this leads us to talking about a sort of uncertainty in the biogeochemical measurements that underlie the proxy, right? Um, which again, Jeremy was talking about. And I'm going to use um, an example here, a simple one: particulate organic carbon. Right? We were just uh, talking about the one your poster, DOC, UV attenuation, the proxy for that. Um, it's one of those kind of base. One, one thing out of your IOP, they co vary with math. DOC is a thing that a lot of people are interested in. So, just talk, stepping through some of the major issues, but just in this one thing, you know, you want to think about um, in your in, in your C truth measurements. So, um, a very early one that was recognized this is a 1977 paper from Will Gardner looking at uh, the POC concentration measured in Nissan bottles with and without the red, which is like what collects in the Nissan bottle below the spigot at the bottom. 
that settles out before you're done sampling. So the, the figure here is a profile. Um, it looks like he's got a discontinuity at the top there, but basically it's the lower um, 35 or uh, 1500 meters of the, the ocean. So profile going down um, from a thousand meters to the seabed. And there's two lines, one with filled circles and one with open circles. And the one with open circles is um, if, you, uh, if you correct for the dregs that are left at the bottom versus if you don't. Right, so it's approaching, you know, 20 to 40, 50 percent of the COC signal from that. So, um, so that definitely, uh, and it, it turns out actually that without the dregs correlates better with the POC, um, or with the beam simulation rather. So, that's like a question that's that sort of being put about in the POC. Um, other things I don't know, figures for um, the protection of your sample from air contamination or filtering, making sure you're not getting stuff from the stacks or inlay uh, issues in the laboratory, working under a heavy filtered bench, or just a way to, to avoid that. Low vacuum pressure, um, things I learned about this when you were filtering through chlorophyll, you want to keep that vacuum pressure low so you're not popping cells and sucking them through the filter and so they were hurtful in the environment. Um, so that matters to POC as well. Um, another big one that's received a lot of attention more recently is adsorption of dissolved organic carbon onto the glass fiber filter uh, surfaces during filtration and artificially elevating the measured POC. Um, so the, the idea is that there's some capacity that a GFF, a glass fiber filter, has to absorb POC. And that absorption is necessarily instantaneous while you're filtering, and more is it linear with the volume filter. And so you need to somehow correct for that. Um, a lot of people could uh, have suggested making a, a volume, um, a series of increasing volumes to see, okay, for your procedure, how much DOC do you absorb in your environment for collecting your filtering and then pouring it back through another filter to measure how much has been absorbed. Um, on your original filter with the particles. You can get correction factors that way. Um, so several papers that have been looking into that. Um, and there was a, a best practices, uh, I believe the paper came out, or technical report, I guess it just came out a couple of years ago, um, that went through all of the uncertainty factors going into the POC. But this is a graph that's been showing um, the uncertainty budget for POC samples collected along a transect um, going along from the open ocean up to a coastline. So the upper panel is just distance along transect, and then you can see the POC climbs a little bit without going to the coastal region. The lower panel is just stacked bar with different colors showing the fractional contribution to the uncertainty of these different factors in POC. So most of the time, especially in the open ocean samples, that highest contribution, total uncertainty in mass carbon, that's actually the analytical this uncertainty from the elements that analyze for itself. So that's a good thing. You want that to be your major contributor to uncertainty, not some other aspect of how you're collecting or handling your sample. But occasionally, um, you can see there are places where the light blue bar is higher, right, showing that there's a bigger influence of the filtrate blank on the sample. And every now and then, particularly in the um, the coastal samples, the uncertainty in the filtration volume, right? You guys did this with chlorophyll a couple of weeks ago, right? Where you looked into the impact of the uncertainty and how much you poured out of your graduated cylinder, right? So as you get higher and higher concentration, you need to filter less and less. And so now the volume begins to be an important factor. So when you're making proxies, take home message here is you wanna know what's the source of uncertainty in your incision data. Right, and how well you can control that. And think about how you propagate that in the property or in your um, Some examples um, for POC algorithms um, more broadly, I'm thinking about like variability in the slopes of these proxy relationships. You can take from a paper that Ivana wrote um, based on the Atlantic Living Experiment in 2008, and this slide is next to it from her. Um, but basically, in that paper, she took um, so their data from their crews, the North Atlantic Bloom 08, which is the gray dots on, on the panel. Um, she compared the, the best fit to their data, which is the red line. Um, that would be this line right here. 
that's the figure in the line that's set to the points. Comparing that line to similar data sets collected um, in earlier studies, so um, Jagoff's um, paper from Joe Bishop and Mara. And you can see that uh, regardless of um, the study, there's pretty similar relationships, right? POC to mean attenuation, not too variable. We'll get back to that in a second. However, if we do that same bit with particulate backscattering, there's a lot more variability. And so this comes back to this idea of there's a, you know, we expect there to be a physical relationship between our proxy and the thing we're interested in. And we expect the thing we're interested in to be the primary control over what the proxy does. In this case, you know, there's a lot more variability in backscattering compared to being attenuation. Um, and these different lines from these different studies reflect environments where, you know, there's higher amounts of large diatoms versus small scattering population boards. And it's also related to the fact that backscattering is going to be more sensitive to changes in refractive index and cell size than mean attenuation. Right, based on um, sort of the relationship between physical uh, scattering of particles and the composition of the that thought on Okay. Yes. So, which is probably by the middle of the middle. Right. Yeah. So, if you have a crucial reason that you know particles are always the same, always dominated by the same constituents, you might be able to come up with a, a decent proxy. But would you want to extend it beyond that reason? Probably not. And if it's a crucial reason, you may also find a little more there. You may not only have one kind of Yeah. So, so it can get even more complex. But if you do, I mean, I did uh, work in India Top Live for my graduate, um, my graduate work. And the part of it that I was working in was the shallow, really, really, really urban and dominated by these systems most of the time. So I actually could do the problem model what was there to stay But yeah, it gets, as you know, a lot more complicated. Uh -oh. Um, so I just got done a slide ago telling you that um POC flow is pretty well constrained with respect to beam attenuation. Um in the same paper that Ivana and her colleagues wrote in 2012, though they compiled all the POC versus beam attenuation flows, right? So you can think of this as CT star, right? The mass or carbon specific beam attenuation coefficient. And looked at how that varied across different studies that were available in the literature, and indeed found even with the attenuation POC, there is a um, a systematic variability um, that should increase in the beam attenuation, and also in chlorophyll concentration. You also are tend to go from systems with smaller larger cells, maybe from oligotrophic to eutrophic systems, and different compositions of cytoplasm. Right. So it can vary systematically, yes, the main So just a thing to be careful about with proxies that you're again, extrapolating them the right amount or not, right? If you're using um, apply proxy, you need to be like two other You're thinking about rich mile. I was like, there's a thought. So you can see both of them. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's. Yeah, I noticed that in the paper, it doesn't do for the field. We have to bring different interpretations to what it is. It has to do with acceptance angle and sign in order that for the chance to read us and get a lot of CPUs. So you can the same thing that you interpret. And I was from the Bureau of the States, I told them. Like, uh, mm -hmm. in my so, yeah, the, the, the one who is one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you will not review the practice. I mean, just looking at these results, I feel like the relationship that survived the study is still in the primary They have like 70 and if you remove. 
B is hard for that, but C is hard. I think there are so few studies that are able to come up with these data that you can do. I think the public can keep one and say, well, you can just play. Oh, they use this number. Yeah. They use this number with this acceptance angle. But just surprisingly, because I'm talking about that. Yeah, yeah. that is nothing. <laughs> I'm assuming the dashed lines represent the uncertainty of the fit that's shown. Yeah, it's the 95% confidence yeah. interval around the Gardner fit. Around the Gardner. Yeah, so sorry, the, the solid line is the linear fit to the Gardner data points, oh. only, and the dashed line is done. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So then this is looking at copy. Because when I look at this, I don't see any stuff. Yeah. And, and by the way, there's, there's been a uh, uh, multi there, there are two random. Numbers A and B, and you drop A over B versus B, you're going to get yeah, okay. yeah, both of them totally right. Yeah, so yeah, my, my interpretation is each, each of these is unique, and you need to be very and as somebody who's like building global practice with like 40 data points, yeah. like <laughs> because the data points are really hard to come up, yeah. But you need to be very thoughtful about why it is important to get from the next and are you able to account for all the potential right? And if you decide, okay, the variability among the systems is still the dominant factor, then go ahead and try to answer those questions. So, yeah. The last example of all the things that you have to think about with PLC for my, my small example, but like anything that you're trying to successfully do. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, this brings me to this my last case study, um, which is uh, thinking about your training data set has a restricted domain, right? You've got your data from somewhere, you may or may not represent all places in the ocean fully. In your training data set, and so when is it justified to extrapolate beyond it? And that's the analysis. And so for that, we're going to use dissolver mass carbon and CDOM, <laughs> um, which um, in the coastal ocean actually you can use CDOM as a proxy for GOC. It works best in places where you only have one source of CDOM and GOC, like a river plume or a swamp outlet or something like that, and you only have one way that it's going away. So we in the ocean, right? So this is a very simple system. You're not worried about photo bleaching, right? Or changes in the DOC to the relationship or natural processes within your system. Then you can do this. And people can do this fairly successfully in restricted systems. Doesn't mean you can take your relationship with your algorithm and go down to the next estuary or the next river or a river somewhere else in the world. Right. For instance, this is this is sometimes a good approach. Um, the two figures here are just one of them illustrating uh, absorption by CDOM at 355 nanometers in DOC. Um, but I think I showed you this graph which is in earlier in the class. And then the other one is just looking at the relationship between absorption at 355 and salinity and illustrating in an example of a system which dilution by low CDOM water is the primary process of removing that CDOM absorption in this, this system. Um, Another example, um, this is a remote sensing example. Um, Hong Tao, who I can't remember now if he's a student with me in the office class or if he's an MCA in the office class. If he's an office class student, also Maria Georgiou, who. But anyway, this is their, um, they have an empirical algorithm. Looking at DOC and really, really, really highly absorbed CDOM rich mud waters. And um, it seems to work pretty well. Um, note that they're using this is high high resolution remote sensing. So this is from Landsat 18 Sentinel. And they're using all four visible bands to get one per another. <laughs> so it's it's also an example of you know how much information can you pull out of one system with one of it. The covariance of the that we can make. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, CDOM and DOC are not related to one another in the global offshore um, very much. So, this is a scatter plot from a paper, older paper from Normel and Siegel, 
And the, the vertical axis is again UV absorption of CDOM, the horizontal axis is VOC concentration, and the color is the depth. And so you can see it just looks like there's, there is no obvious relationship here. The largest control over uh, DOC concentration seems to be depth, right? Produced at the surface, consumed with time as water runs for the ocean. So you can't really apply this very well in the ocean. And again, it's not surprising that we know that CDOM is just a small component of the DOC. And if you've got a lot of sources and a lot of loss processes like you do in the global ocean, you don't necessarily expect it to be to always have to be. Um, there's an example of a global DOC algorithm from space. Um, in that case, they did an empirical regression against four wave bands, still had to put in salinity, it's another piece of information, and still came out with a root mean square error of 27 to 29 micromoles per liter, um, which you can compare to the X scale that goes from 30 to 100. Right, yeah. so it's it's not uh, an easy proxy to apply outside of. So this is kind of an extreme one, right? <laughs> um, but again, you think about this as you are building proxies. If you're training data come from one place and represent a particular relationship between the thing that you're measuring and the thing that you're trying to retrieve, does that relationship hold outside of the kind of like, exactly the data? Probably an important thing to think about when you're making machine learning algorithms. Okay, so um, this is, oh, this is perfect time. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and what I'd like you guys to do is actually find your teammates that you made your posters with. And what I'm gonna have you do is um, look at your, so you've got, I put here now photographs of your um, sensor posters. You made your proxy posters and do your sensor posters. So go back to your sensor posters on which you wrote a list of proxies that you could retrieve with your sensor. Pick one of them. And with your group, just talk through, this is just a discussion exercise. How would you responsibly develop a proxy using your sensor? based on some of the stuff we've talked about sort of parallel in that. Um, so what type of samples should you collect as you develop this proxy? Where and when will you be collecting them? How are you gonna validate this proxy that it really works? And uh, unlike last week's exercise, assume that you don't have an unlimited budget. Instead, it is unspecified yet finite. So prioritize. What are the most important things that you need to measure? If you wanna have a functional proxy it does what you need to do. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to like make another poster or anything like that. I just like you to talk through the exercise and, and think about what are some of your things that you might talk about doing this. So take 10 or 15 minutes and then when everybody's kind of wrapped up with that, we can kind of morph into some play. 